Welcome back to the Risk Management and Patient Safety Podcast presented by MedPlace. We're excited to bring you conversations with top risk and patient safety thought leaders from organizations around the country. So please subscribe to get the latest news and content. And if you found value from this episode, please feel free to share it with colleagues to create some meaningful dialogues in your community. And if you yourself are interested in participating as a guest, please send us an email at marketing at medplace.com. And today, uh, my name is Jared Bailey. I'm the CEO of MedPlace. I'm going to be playing host today. And, uh, and I'm joined by Eric Wonder. He's principal and consulting actuary at Milliman. Hey, Eric, how are you doing? I'm doing great, Jared. How are you? I'm doing well. Uh, so, Eric, you and I had the pleasure of meeting, or at least I had the pleasure of meeting you uh, a few weeks ago at an event. And you gave me a ton of interesting data on the industry. And I thought it would be great to have you on the podcast and kind of unpack some of those things and, and, and take your unique perspective. But you got to tell me what what is your perspective? What's what is Milliman and, and and what are you doing there? Like who do you what do you do? What do you, who do you work with on a day to day basis? Sure, absolutely, Jared. Milliman is an actuarial consulting firm. At, at first and foremost, we we do a number of other things, but uh, my role there is as a consulting actuary. So what is an actuary? I suppose that's the next question, right? Uh, an actuary takes a look at all sorts of data, insurance data in particular, and tries to understand that data to project what the cost of coverage is going to look like going forward for the various organizations. Now, my role specifically at Milliman is on looking at physicians and hospitals, uh, sometimes some ancillary general liability coverages on, on the side there, but really looking at what what's going on with the number of claims that are being reported and then the cost of those claims and then translating that into dollars of premiums. Great. Okay, so you're helping us get a little bit more clarity in our cloudy crystal balls so we can make some better decisions. Absolutely. I love it. Well, so let's unpack that topic, right? So uh, you talked about cost of coverage. Um, what have you been seeing in terms of like coverage costs in like recent years? Yeah, it's been pretty interesting in recent years, actually. Uh, cost of coverage has been fairly stagnant, I would say, for, for quite some time, uh, which is interesting because in a normal environment, you think inflation is going up by 3% a year, and if as long as the number of claims that are coming in the door are about the same, the, the cost of those claims is going up, so the premiums are going to go up you know, in a corresponding fashion. But what we've been seeing actually is, is kind of two different dichotomies going on. The, the number of claims coming in the door has been decreasing for, for quite some time, about two decades actually. Wow. Uh, starting in the early 2000s, uh, we saw the number of claims kind of peak, if you will, for the industry. And then since then, it's been a pretty steady downward trend up until uh, uh, and including really these last couple of years. Um, so while the number of claims has gone down, we've seen the cost of those claims go up and that's resulted in a, a pretty steady, I would say, amount of premium that's being charged uh, across the industry. Um, but and, and maybe I should take a step back even the what, what I consider in terms of cost recovery, I, I think about it in three layers, right? Those the first layer is what what's kind of retained. And so for a, a physician out there, that's going to be their deductible. That's maybe zero dollars, maybe ten thousand uh, dollars for a hospital system that you're talking about their self insured retention. That may be, you know, zero dollars still or maybe one hundred thousand dollars, maybe multi million dollars. Uh, so that the, that's kind of the first layer of coverage is going to be what's retained by the by the person who's actually has the risk yeah. and, then, and then they're going to go out and buy insurance uh, and so that's going to be often from a commercial insurance company or or a lot of these larger hospital systems have uh, set up their own captive insurance companies and, and the captive can provide that insurance as well and so that's kind of the, that second layer i would say of coverage and then finally the third layer is kind of that, that reinsurance coverage where the the insurer or captain insurers buying coverage that you know they don't feel comfortable taking on a hundred million dollars of risk so they maybe they want to take on the first 10 million and then buy reinsurance coverage above that uh, so those are the three kind of tiers of coverage and yep. it, it's been pretty interesting of, of late i would say uh 
the especially since I would say 2015 for, for whatever reason, and I, I can't pinpoint the 2015 for any particular reason, but these uh, what I'll call nuclear verdicts mm. and I'll loosely define a nuclear verdict as something that's, you know, $10 million or more of, of a paid claim. And th those have really been on the rise in the yeah. recent years. Um, and so starting in 2015, we really saw a boom there. And, and that has really translated into that, that reinsurance layer, that top layer where they're taking on those, those high dollar. Uh, 2015, and that's resulted in, in their raising rates on the insurance companies. And then there's obviously some pass along costs there back to the, the physicians and healthcare systems as well. Yeah. So it, it's been it's been interesting in the cost of coverage in, in recent years. Interesting. So okay. So so knowing that, I mean, maybe maybe is that trend expected to continue? And and whatever the, the trends are, like, how do I make better decisions at this point? Like, what sorts of things do I need to either brace for or you know uh, consider if I'm you know if I'm if I'm looking at these trends? Yeah, it's a great question, and it's a difficult one to to fully unpack, but. Certainly, the one of the in speaking with my clients, one of the reactions that I've had is, you know, my reinsurance premiums are going up by twenty percent, and I, I don't think that's fair. I've never had one of these big claims that I hear about the news, and I don't feel like I should be paying for that. What would you think, Eric, about not paying for that coverage and just taking on that risk by myself, and you know, the, the answer there is that's risky, right? Mm, oh, right. If you do end up having that, you know, one in, I would say maybe there's 20, 50 of those claims in the year nationwide. I, but it seems like once a week, if you're looking for it, you can find something on Google that says, you know, here's yeah. another $13 million claim that was settled this week. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's all, you know, lightning strikes. It happens, and so if, if you decide to go bear there, you might be fine for five years, and then sixth year you might get hit with a fifty million dollar claim, and that's going to hurt. Um, on the other hand, you could pay that the pay that reinsurer, and they'll you know they'll charge you for it because they're seeing it elsewhere. Um, mm -hmm. But when it does hit you, if it does, at least you're covered covered there. Um, and, and one of the other considerations there is, is how tall to build that tower, right? A lot of these, especially larger healthcare systems, um, you know, they, they may have coverage up to 10 million or coverage up to 50 million or 100 million or, or so on. Um, and, you know, how, how tall to build that tower should be a consideration when you're thinking about the reinsurance costs and what you want to be thinking about there. Uh, you know, there's there's no right answer. You have to take a look at your own personal risk, talk to your brokers about what's, what the best options are. But uh, it's it's definitely a complex question and one that you need to have kind of on the forefront of your mind on, as a risk manager. Mm, interesting. You, no, no, I'm sure you don't you don't see everyone's decisions, what everyone's doing. Do you see any trends as far as decision making goes, as far as what hospitals are doing or systems or, you know, uh, uh, trends in, you know, maybe the smaller clinics are going to go one direction versus like a large system is going to have maybe different options. Um, what does that look like? Yeah, so a, a lot of the smaller clinics are still, I would say, largely buying commercial coverage uh, yeah. from, from somewhere in the commercial insurance market and not doing their own captives or, or doing their own self insurance reinsurance programs. But uh, so the, the smaller clinics, they may be t looking at taking on more of that first dollar risk. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, getting a, a reduction in their premiums because they're taking on that first hundred thousand dollars or what have you. Um, but buying more coverage seems to be the trend these days in terms of the amount of limits you're covered up to. Uh, that's definitely so in increasing the height of the tower there. That is. Yeah, absolutely. That's mean, yeah. Put it, uh, increasing the height of that tower. Um, and, you know, it's it's getting more expensive, and, and, and in many cases, actually, with some of the larger hospital systems that I've I've worked with, uh, I've seen sort of it being pushed to them, if you will, where the the reinsurer won't 
won't touch anything up until $2 million or $5 million. They just don't want that risk. They want to keep that low dollar risk with the hospital system uh, and then only really attach, if you will, at, at $5 million or what have you. And yeah. And the other part then is that any given reinsurer, they may only want, you know, from five to 10, you may have to go to somebody else to get 10 to 20 and 20 to 30. Um, so it, it, you really become dependent upon the broker to find the right reinsurance partners for you in, the, in those cases. Um, that's That's been one of the trends that I've seen in recent years is, you know, the premiums are going up and that those reinsurers want to take on less risk per hospital. Um, so they want to diversify as best they can. Yeah, interesting. You know, I, I always wonder who's innovating in a particular space or when you have, you know, a hardening market and you've got, you've got the trends that we're seeing. Have you seen any innovation going on in this space or new ideas, um, new players, anything like that that's kind of been introduced to the game board? Or, or are we dealing, are we working with the same tools we had, you know, 10 years ago? Yeah, in many cases, we are working with a lot of the a lot of the same pieces that we've been working with for quite some time. Uh, certainly, I think that there's uh, an aversion, if you will, to to change. Uh, I think some of that's just human nature, right? You know, if it's not broke, why fix it? Yeah. Uh, which it, it's a tough thing to overcome, and and there's a lot of costs that come with with change and technology. Um, you know, there there's the physical you know dollars that get must get put into it um and you know there's also a human element of why do i need to change this you know there's the inertia to it and but once you i think you get the inertia going uh there's there's some amount of change that just kind of gets developed into the company culture that that organizational culture that's that's i think the toughest uh hurdle to clear is getting getting through that first push and helping people understand that the technology can help yeah. uh, and make their make their lives easier. Um, one of the things that I think the pandemic has shown us is that the, the telehealth has it can be a really important part of any organiz any healthcare organization's uh, care program. Yeah, um, and and there's issues there as well. I mean, there's I would say the number one issue that everyone's kind of been waiting on is the legislative impact, right? Uh, I think Congress did a pretty decent job early early stages of the pandemic, making sure that all the Medicare reimbursements were being uh, given appropriately, given that a lot of the care was being delivered via telehealth and not in-house. Uh, and that was important at the time because everyone was distancing themselves, practicing social distancing. Um, but a lot of those telehealth reimbursements were being done at a lower rate in the early pre-pandemic. Um, yeah. And a lot of that legislation is set to expire at some point in time. Some of it already has, some of it will in the future. Um, I know Congress is working. Uh, they've, they've got numerous bills that they're looking at to extend or expand even uh, some of those, those waivers for, for Medicare to make those, uh, I would say, um, those, those waivers a little more permanent for, for the healthcare providers. Uh, and to me, and then I'm no legislative expert, certainly, but to me that there seems to be enough bipartisan support for those types of things that I think we will see sort of a telehealth reform uh, on the Medicare side. And, and if Medicare is pushing it, you know, it's only a matter of time before non-Medicare uh, ends yeah. up the same thing. So I think that's going to be great for the industry. I think a lot of the patients seem to be enjoying that telehealth flexibility. I mean, there's certainly a contingent that always wants to be in seeing their doctor as, as they normally have, but just having the option to call up or have a video call, uh, it just adds so much flexibility. And I, I, I think that it's it's going to be tough to put that one back in the back Well, the it, it's, as somebody who hasn't walked into a retail store in 10 years and I get everything on Amazon, I, I have to tell you, you know, I, I had COVID a few months ago and to be able to to dial in and do a video call with, with my doctor was delightful, right? So <laughs> as consumers, I, I think, you know, we've been trained by much bigger companies to you know to to want and reach for convenience so you know i think the the cat's sort of out of the bag there and and uh you know telehealth is sort of inevitable and then the question is is you know how does it get uh you know regulated and the quality brought up and, and all the other controls that we would expect to see out of something that's that's gone mainstream 
Um, and it's interesting, you know, we're we're managing our risk like we we've done for decades, and yet the world has changed. It's rotated underneath us, right? We've got these new technologies, we've got these new delivery models, and you know, as I look at the landscape of, uh, you know, because we're we're a technology company in the space, right? Looking to innovate, and I'm looking at other innovators, and I tell you what. There's a lot of innovation going on on the on the plaintiff side of, of this equation, right? There's a ton of organization and AI and some really interesting stuff from a, just from a, putting a technology lens on. And you know that you know that battlefield has changed, right? And and there's you know I often say there's there's you know a lot of uh, knives bring, being brought to gunfights these days. Um, and, you know, and, and but you also see some really interesting innovation uh, on, you know, on the healthcare delivery side to really sort of avoid these, these nuclear verdicts to begin with, right? So, you know, I find, you know, what's available now from an analytics perspective to be able to use data to really identify where you have risks in your, in your delivery model and be able to uh, you know, eliminate and mitigate and minimize those types of things is all. I think also where a lot of the you know the battles being, if there's battles being won, it's on that front, right? Um, but you do you do require a certain amount of uh, leaning into technology, like sort of culturally within hospitals. It's very often you find a, a sort of aversion to certain types of technology, right? Especially when it comes to things like around. Um, you know, monitoring, measuring, delivery care, and stuff like that. So I'm really encouraged by what I see out there, what's available, and by, you know, some of the the really innovative hospitals that have adopted some of these methods. So, you know, when you look at the whole stack of risk, right, it kind of starts there, the delivery. Um, it's just interesting to me what, you know, what's going on, and, and yet I still recognize there's a, there's a big gap in terms of adoption of, you know, things that are out there. Yeah, and you spoke to a lot of points that I'll try and hit on a couple of them. Uh, but first and foremost, I would say data is king, right? That's that's what the plaintiffs are relying on. They're sharing their methods and techniques, and yeah. they've got their their life care plans. That they've really been pushing to drive up costs. Uh, so there's they're very organized, and and they seem to be coordinated in what they're doing. And that that I think probably plays into a little bit of those nuclear verdicts that I talked about earlier. Uh, so on, on the defensive side, you know, if you're talking about being a risk manager and how to manage those risks, data is king. You, you, it's difficult sometimes to ask, you know, one of your doctors to report an incident that may, you know, something went wrong, right? And we, we can't tell uh, as a layperson if there was a medical issue there that something, you know, was negligent. But if something went wrong, you are much, much, much high, more likely to see a lawsuit or a claim come through your door. And if, if as a risk manager, you can take a look at that before that even happens and say, okay, something went wrong, what happened? Just dissect it a little bit. Not only will the care of delivery, delivery the, the care improve going forward, just because you've had those conversations, and you've, you've maybe learned a little bit from a mistake, or maybe even it wasn't a mistake. Maybe it was just a bad thing that happened. Medicine is a very touchy and evolving subject. It's, it changes all the time, and we learn things uh, every day on it. Um, but just having those conversations and learning about how to deliver the care the best. Um, and then if you do find something that, that went wrong, and you know, there's certain healthcare systems in particular that uh, have had these sort of apology uh, tours that, that seem to be working. Um, I, I don't know that there's a lot of data to support that, but anecdotally, I certainly think that there's there's some justification to that where, you know. And are we talking about like communication and resolution programs, CRP programs, and early resolution type stuff? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And just, just reaching out to patients and just saying, hey, you know, we understand something went wrong here. Uh, we're, we're looking into it and, you know, even if just keeping those lines of communication open to them, understanding, hey, you know, something went wrong with the delivery care or, hey, you know, this was just a complication we could not have possibly foreseen, uh, just giving them understanding and because your layperson, you know, looks at medicine, your, your average consumer is going to say, these are the experts, they should know exactly what to do every time. But, you know, 
doctors don't always know the, what the right thing to do every time. They're they're alert, they're dealing with an evolving situation and they're making the best decisions they can based on the information available. And that that may be an incomplete picture a lot of times. Uh, and so it's a difficult difficult space to be in. Uh, but managing that risk and, and dealing with these early resolution programs and trying to mitigate the risk that way, it, it can be helpful. I think. Yeah, I mean, you know, if you if you look at it, and you know, this has been happening for longer than COVID, but I think COVID exacerbated it. You've got you've got this new element of you know the 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 patient is is coming in with you know a a, a perception of education and uh, in and empowerment or or you know just a just a perception of healthcare and and it, and it's turning you know. Uh, you know, combative in some cases, and you've got this like this sort of what feels like a shift um, of you know I I always trust my doctor implicitly to to now there's there's something else that's been introduced into that relationship and it's causing you know headlines and all sorts of things it's causing a lot of difficulty for yeah. physicians and nurses and, and clinical providers in the clinical setting. Um, and that's that's really been exacerbated recently. I don't know when and how the trend started, but you've also got some of that happening too. And I'm sure that there's you know contributing factors and and um, you know from from all sides. But it's uh, it's been really you know challenging to see uh, when you have a shift in in culture and in sort of you know a relationship with your healthcare provider you know we really do need to be thinking about different methods like how do we combat that right and when you look at these crp programs and i've heard some pretty powerful stories of you know hospitals really maintaining their brand their brand equity um in their patient relationship and uh really it's just a, a very you know 180 you know, turn on what historically has been, a, you know, a very different sort of reaction to, you know, when things go wrong. And so I, I don't know if that's the right answer, but it does feel like it's a counter to some of these, you know, um, some of these relationship changes that have been that have been happening. Yeah, exactly. And I, I don't know if it's the right answer. It's certainly it can't be the right answer all the time, right? Yeah. But it's another tool in the toolbox and if you yeah. if you don't have that tool in the toolbox you're probably missing out on something uh so just having those options available making sure that you've got the innovation in the right place there to make sure that you've got the people that know what to do and and how to resolve these issues as best they can it, yeah. it, it certainly can't hurt having that, that extra tool in the toolbox to reduce that that risk that liability yeah so it's interesting we have innovation from a technology perspective that tends to be an obvious one but you've got innovation from a a response perspective right that's that's another area of innovation i think that we're seeing are you and i don't know how much you're tied to any of the legislative uh, things that are going out going on out there is there any innovation happening at the legislative level to change things or um you know good or bad is there is there any kind of new introductions of ideas that that you're aware of there Yes, yeah, so I'm not I'm not super tight in there. Uh, I know that the, the Medicare reimbursement one is the one that's getting, I would say, the most headlines in terms of what people are looking at, uh, because that that impacts more the delivery of care side of things. On the liability side, there has been talk off and on for, for a long time, uh, maybe going back to George W. Bush about some sort of. Uh, federal. Tort reform. Where, where we're talking about damage caps or this side or the other thing. Um, but those those types of conversations, I think, have waned a bit in recent years. Uh, certainly, there's been more protections put in place, the Good Samaritan laws uh, in recent years with COVID, uh, just making sure that the providers feel like they're protect, protected when they're giving care. Um, but a lot of those, those conversations really don't happen at the federal level as much. A lot of them happen at the state level. Yeah. Uh, if, if anything, I would say the, the the state level pendulums, they tend to swing back and forth over time. Right now they're swinging, I guess, pro plaintiff, if you will, uh, where some of the, the the indemnity damage caps are increasing or the the amount of interest that's being paid, um, you know, pre or post verdict, those those amounts are increasing. Um, so you're, you're seeing that the plaintiffs side start to pick up some wins there i guess at the state level uh that seems to be the trend and obviously there's 50 different states going so they're not all swinging the same way at the same time but as a whole i would say that's the way things seem to be trending 
Well, we'll, we'll uh, we're planning on a, a episode here where we bring in uh, some some legal folks and sort of unpack some of the trends going on. And it really is being done at the state level, right? I think the chances of, of seeing anything meaningful at the federal level is is going to be very difficult to see something go through there. But I am seeing, you know, at the state level, some new ideas being introduced. So we'll unpack there. So. Eric, as you're working with your clients day to day, what what sorts of questions are they asking? Like, what are you helping them through primarily at this point? Yeah, so I mentioned at the outset, I deal with you know looking at the data, coming up with with premiums that that can be charged for for these coverages. Uh, I'm also dealing with the reserving side of things, uh, as as I'm sure this audience knows pretty well. Medical professional liability coverage takes oftentimes several years to resolve. And so if you've got an insurance company who or captive insurance company, which are primarily most of my clients, uh, they are thinking about how much money they need to hold from that premium they brought in in order to pay out all these potential claims that are coming in the door. Um, so that's been an issue of late. Uh, COVID has impacted that in two ways, which I think is where most of the questions have been coming from lately. Uh, on the one hand, the COVID has really shut down the courts uh, or slowed the processes down quite a bit. And a, a lot of times a, a trial date or, or something along those lines will really push the two parties, uh, the plaintiff and defendant, towards some sort of settlement agreement. And with those court dates really not looming anymore, uh, they've been really pushed out for, for quite some time as as the courts deal with criminal cases or or other things that are a little bit more I'll call yeah. press. Um, there's there's been a slowdown there, and so these the the dollars of reserves that are being held on these balance sheets just keep increasing and increasing and increasing because they can't they can't get anything through the door. They can't get anyone to settle anything. Um, so that's that's been one issue. That's been a trend that I think. Uh, most of the entire industry has been seeing. Uh, so that, that's been interesting. Um, and then on the other side from COVID, uh, I would say that the, and I mentioned this a little bit earlier, the, the number of reported claims has just been decreasing for, for about two decades. And it, it seems to have, uh, I, I don't know if I'd go quite as far as say cratered, but uh, it saw another decent jump downward uh, in, in 2020 and continuing into 2021. Uh, and that's maybe to be expected, right? I mean, we've still got these technology advances. We're still moving in that direction with our process and CRP programs and all that. But on top of that, then we saw an exposure reduction because we saw, you know, it affected the larger healthcare industry in a, in a negative way, right? There was fewer elective surgeries. There were fewer, you know, checkups. People were just a little more hesitant to put themselves in an environment where they may come in contact with someone that has COVID, mm -hmm. and that that hurt on the bottom line for for a lot of the the healthcare providers. But because they were seeing less patients, there was less opportunities for errors, or uh, and by that, you know, fewer claims and lawsuits being brought by by patients and and their plaintiff attorneys. So in, in that sense, uh, the number of reported claims because of COVID actually has come down uh, in these last 18 months or two years now. Um, now, it's unclear whether that's going to be permanent or temporary. My belief is that it's going to be temporary. You know, I yeah, think once we get back to business as usual. Exactly. I, and, you know, time will tell there, but it, it just all, all signs point to that once once standard, once the care delivery of care kind of goes back to normal. Uh, we're, we're probably going to see claims rebound a little bit. Um, but but those are the two things that I guess my my clients have been asking me most about is kind of where's COVID, COVID impacting us on the liability side? And, and those those I think are the two primary drivers. Yeah, and I know there's still a lot of questions, a lot of unknowns around the, you know, the COVID sort of safe harbor laws and things that have been passed. And, and there's a lot of, you know, a lot of folks on the other side uh, looking at, at ways to, you know, uh, I don't know, not get around them, but uh, but I mean, you're seeing you're seeing some some chinks in the armor a little bit. Um, so we don't know where that's going. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen from that. I think we're all kind of waiting for that. Um, 
But as we get back to business as usual, it's it's nice to at least know that there was some silver lining with, I mean, I don't know one hospital that hasn't been struggling through COVID to, to even turn anything remotely close to a profit. Um, but then, you know, it's at least, you know, at least the lawsuits have been tapering off during that time. Um, but this is great. Well, Eric, any other kind of parting advice for our, our audience or anything else you want to say before we close it up for today? No, I just want to say thank you for having me on. It's been, it's been great talking with you. And uh, I know you mentioned at the outset that you had the, the pleasure of meeting me. I, I would say the pleasure was all on this side. So I appreciate uh, you reaching out and it's been, been great meeting you know, these last couple weeks here. Likewise. Hey, uh, if people want to get a hold of you, is there anywhere that you'd like to send them? Sure. Uh, if you'd like to, you can uh, look me up at millman.com. Uh, the name is Eric Wonder, W-U-N-D-E-R. So uh, if, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Sounds good. We'll uh, we'll link to your uh, to that and uh, anywhere else that you want to also in the in the show notes here. But Eric, as always, it's a pleasure. Thanks for for coming and talking me through all this stuff today. Sure thing. Thanks, Jared.